Hello, this is Steve Christie, aka Born Again RN. I'm making this video because a little while ago I started making shorts on my YouTube channel responding to just common objections and questions regarding the biblical canon as well as other non related topics. And it was in response to an individual on Twitter or X who is asking for me to make um, sort of elevator pitches when they have interactions with, with Catholics. You know, so I thought, well, you know, shorts, they take less than a minute. It should be something that's not very um, in depth, but something that, you know, can be something really quick when you're in a conversation with someone and you want to have to respond uh, uh, relatively fast. Um, however, I had some interactions with an individual by the name of Fro on my YouTube channel. Uh, he goes by uh, the pa Pale Galilee, and that's his YouTube channel. And I debated him last year on uh, Donnie's channel, Standing for Truth. In fact, I'll put a link in the description below so you can check that particular debate out that we had on the canon. So he had mentioned that he thought it might have been a reaction to him, this um these shorts that I'm making, I can assure him that it wasn't. It was just things that I thought off the top of my head of specific things that Catholics and Protestants and others disagree on, and I thought I would address it in some uh, shorts. Well, since then, it was brought to my attention that Fro had produced his own video response that went on for about an hour or, four, or about an hour and forty minutes or so responding to each one of my individual shorts, as well as the discussion that I had with my friend Jeff Robinson from A Goy for Jesus, which I'll also post in the description below this video. So I wanted to respond to some of the claims and assertions, as well as his review that he had on these, because I don't think that there's some things that he took into consideration, um, particularly about whether the Sadducees and the Pharisees had different canons or not, as well as uh, the books that were laid up in the temple, and especially, and this will be towards the end, if Origen had misunderstood Josephus or not, but we'll get to that later on. So the first um, subject that I want to talk about is about the Apostle Paul and Rabbi Akiva, who had embraced the Hebrew Bible, which are the same books that are in the Protestant Old Testament. And the reason why this was in, this was significant and why I brought this up in my short is that the is that Gary Machuda had mentioned that Rabbi Akiva, who had lived at the end of the first century, uh, who had been around when the temple was destroyed, would have known what books were laid up in the temple. And uh, Gary had mentioned that he was from the Pharisaic school, specifically of Hillel, because there was a couple of different schools. Shammai was the other one, but he was part of the school of Hillel, and Hillel was the grandfather of Gamaliel, who was uh, the mentor of the Apostle Paul. And he, Gary had also mentioned um, that the school of Hillel embraced the same books that Protestants do today. In fact, he stated on Apocrypha Apocalypse, which is his YouTube channel, that he, William Albrecht, and Trent Horn had, from Catholic Answers had all uh, conceded that the um, that the school of Hillel embraced the same books that Protestants do today. Well, uh, Lee Martin McDonald, who wrote this book, it's called The Biblical Canon, and the reason I'm bringing this up for is because a lot of times Catholics, including Gary, like to cite him because he does not believe that there was a settled Jewish canon in the first century. He actually concedes that the Apostle Paul was from the school of Hillel, so it follows that the Apostle Paul and Rabbi Akiva, who are both from the school of Hillel, they both embraced the books of the Hebrew Bible, which were identical to uh, Protestants. Now, one of the things Fro brought up was well, the Apostle Paul could be wrong, even though he was a writer of inspired scripture. And he tried to use this example that, in general, people during his time period had embraced in what's called geocentrism, uh, that everything revolves around the earth as opposed to the planets revolving around the sun, which ironically is a belief that um, Dr. Robert Syngenis believes in. He actually believes in geocentrism, uh, which scientifically cannot be proven. It's it, it, the heliocentrism centrism that the planets revolve around the sun is actually more scientific. But um, 
Fro was trying to use this example, and he actually went so far in, in his discussion and review that uh, Paul was a geocentrist himself. But it's really a non sequitur because just because people during that time period may have believed in geocentrism, it doesn't follow that the Apostle Paul did. One reason being is that unlike everyone else, the Apostle Paul was a writer of inspired scripture, and he would have not conceded to um, this belief since scripture does not actually support geocentrism. Uh, so it's a bit of a straw man argument there. But the other issue that's actually more important that Fro tend to overlook was not only was Paul a Pharisee, he was also a member of the Sanhedrin. And like Rabbi Akiva, he would have known what books were laid up in the temple. If anybody would have known, it would have been the Apostle Paul. In fact, we know he was a member of the Sanhedrin um, from Jewish literature, but also in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul um, wishes that people could be like him, meaning single. And in order to be a member of the Sanhedrin, you had to be married. So at some point between him being a member of the Sanhedrin, when he was an unbelieving Jew and rejected Jesus as his Messiah, and he became a believer in Christ when Christ converted him on the road to Damascus, um, something happened with his marriage, whether his wife died or possibly left him, we don't know. We just know that he went from being married uh, to being single. Nonetheless, as a member of the Sanhedrin, he would have known what books were laid up in the temple. Um, and yet he embraced the same books that Protestants do today, and he would not have embraced a canon that was different than what was laid up in the, in the temple. And we'll get to the books being laid up in the temple later on. Uh, and the other thing is that the Sadducees and Pharisees, uh, they did not have different canons. And this is something that we'll get, get into a little bit later. But uh, one thing I do want to mention is that one thing that I referenced and that Fro had referenced in his video is that this particular book, I don't know if you can see it, but it's called The Old Testament Canon of the New Testament Church by Roger Beckwith. And what it is, he's a canon scholar just like uh, Lee Martin McDonald. And he, it's a, it's a pretty hefty tome. It's, a, it's about 450 to 500 pages, you know, with, uh, with end notes. And just to kind of give you an idea, my, my book, Why Protestant Bibles Are Smaller, it's about 270 pages, and it's got about 630 footnotes. And by comparison, Roger Beckwith has about twice as many end notes as I have footnotes. But so he's done an extensive amount of research in, in this. But I wanted to um, quote from a couple things here to demonstrate that the Pharisee or the Sadducees did not was not limited to the five books of Moses because Beckwith ends up quoting Josephus from Antiquity of the Jews. This is from Book Five, Section One, Verse Seventeen. And it reads, quote, that the length of the day increased on that occasion and exceeded the customary measure is made clear through the scriptures laid up in the temple. And he's referencing Joshua chapter 10, verses 12 through 14. So here's one example that the five books of Moses were not the only books that were laid up in the temple. And the reason this is significant for, as we'll get to later, it was the Sadducees, not the Pharisees, that laid these books up in the temple. But And then he goes on to say that the temple was a holy place from which all uncleanness had to be scrupulously removed. And then he goes down and say, moreover, the reasons why the Pharisees held to the scriptures make the hands unclean, and then make the hands unclean was a way of saying that um, this is that these books are scripture. If a book is not scripture, they do not make the hands unclean. So the reason why the Pharisees held that the scriptures made the hands unclean could not apply to ordinary books. So, um, so apparently the Tosefta that he ends up referencing earlier is referring to canonical books and saying that other copies of the scriptures must not be brought into the temple since these make the hands unclean wherever they are. And then he finishes off by saying, if the temple copies of canonical books needed to be renewed or increased in number, it could only be done within the temple itself by the temple scribes. In other words, the Sadducees who were in charge of the temple would not be allowed to bring books into the temple, even if they were books that the Pharisees accepted that the Sadducees um, allegedly did not ac accept. But again, we're going to get into that later. But what this demonstrates is, this, is that the Sadducees embraced other books 
um, in their canon that uh, other than the five books of Moses. And oh, here we go. And, and as a matter of fact, uh, I'm going to leave a description of my discussion with Donnie uh, do that I had last year regarding the canon. But there's examples where the Sadducees uh, did accept other books besides the five books of Moses, both in Scripture and outside of Scripture. Uh, for example, the uh, Sadducees end up quoting Job chapter 7, verse 9, specifically as Scripture. It's in a work called Tanhumacy, which was a later mid midrashim, but nonetheless, it, it was a quotation from the, the Sadducees accepting this book that was not part of the Torah. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus is talking to the Pharisees and the Sadducees when he ends up talking about the sign of Jonah, and he specifically quotes Jonah chapter 1, verse 17. Now, here's the thing. If the Sadducees did not accept Jonah as scripture, they this wouldn't have meant anything to them. He, they could even came out and say, well, I'm sorry, this is not a book that we accept. We only accept the Torah. But the reason he's saying this to the Pharisees and the Sadducees is because this was a book that they both embraced. Likewise, when Jesus is speaking with the Sanhedrin, which again were made up of both Pharisees and Sadducees, he ends up uh, quoting Daniel chapter 7, verse 13 in Matthew 16, 64, when he says, a son of God coming on the clouds of heaven. Likewise, uh, in Luke chapter 22, verse 69, he quotes, Jesus quotes uh, Psalm chapter uh, 110, when he says, the son of man sits on the right hand of God. Now, later on, I'll bring up that Fro is thinking that he might be refer referencing back to the Torah, but the point is he's not referencing back to the Torah. He's actually specifically quoting Daniel and the Psalms as scripture to the Sanhedrin, which were made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, demonstrating that they accept these as scripture. Otherwise, he wouldn't have quoted this if they did not consider this to be authoritative scripture. Likewise, later on, the Apostle Paul ends up quoting Ezekiel 13 when he's talking with Ananias, the high priest, who is a Sadducee, when he ends up calling him a whitewashed wall in Acts chapter 23. And also, and lastly, Jesus refers to himself as the Christ and the son of David when he's speaking with the Sadducees. And we find out in the Gospels that the Sadducees resented Jesus for adopting these titles which this term is not found in the Torah. It's not found in the five books of Moses. So why would they be upset about him using this, these terms to describe himself if, these, if they only embrace the Torah and they rejected the prophets and the writings, which is where these terms were found? Fro then goes on to say that he ends up basically accusing me, well, well if Paul's wrong on the Old Testament canon then the New Testament canon is wrong. Well, it's a bit of a straw man because I'm not saying that. And it's a bit of a non sequitur because the point I'm trying to make is that he's a writer of inspired scripture and he's a member of the Sanhedrin as well as a Pharisee. He would have known what books were scripture and what books weren't. Plus, he's a writer of inspired scripture and he references back frequently to the canon that he actually accepted. So um, so it's, it's not an issue of, of Paul being uh, wrong here. If anything, Paul is right because of who he is and who he was and the canon that he had accepted. Uh, then at one point, Fro, Fro makes a comment in his review about the biblical inerrancy, meaning that, that the Bible is without error, is a modern phenomenon. Well, how can that be since the Apostle Paul and elsewhere in Scripture states that Scripture is inspired or God-breathed? If something is God-breathed, then it is incapable of error. It's not just that the writers are incapable of, being, of, of error, that the writers of Scripture are protected from error or they're infallible, that God protects them, but that Scripture itself is in error. I, I think what Fro might be thinking about is, is something completely different about copies of scripture versus the original autographs, but we'll get to that later. Um, but then at, at like the 11 minute mark or so, he says that scripture is correct in everything it teaches. Well, if it's correct in everything it, it teaches, then how can inerrancy be a, a modern phenomenon? And then he goes on to give an example of an error that it's, it's true about doctrine, what it teaches, but 
as far as actual facts, they can the scripture can be wrong. Like, and he gave the example of the Earth being a flat, a flat dome that it's more like a disc as, as opposed to a sphere. The problem with that is scripture does not teach that. And he, I don't know if he's referring to the, the passage in Isaiah where it talks about um, sitting on the circle of the Earth, and that's by circle this means like a flat disc, you know, or 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 a, or a flat dome. But that's not what that passage is saying. In fact, you, there's other passages that talk about the earth uh, turning uh, like a signet ring you know, uh, uh, onto clay. And it's the idea of a rotation um, like what we end up seeing like in a globe. Plus, when Jesus in the Gospels is talking about his second coming, he says that there are going to be people who are in the field and there are going to be people who are in bed sleeping. And the context is there is that people only work out in the field when it's light out and people are only bed when it's dark out. Now, if the earth was a disc shape or, or some type of a dome as opposed to a sphere, then it would be light all day or it would be dark all day. But he's Jesus saying simultaneously it's going to be light and dark when he comes back. And that can only happen if the earth is a sphere as opposed to to a disc shapes or, and as opposed to be it being a flat dome but again yet fro believes that the new testament writers like paul are infallible when they are writing inspired scripture well if they're infallible when writing inspired scripture they're not going to write things that aren't aren't true now of course they're going to write e about events of, of things that people did wrong and said wrong but that's different than writing something that is false whether it's scientific whether it's theological or, or something else um, but I can understand why Fro, Fro would be, believe this because this results from Fro having to accept the Deuterocanonical books, so seven extra books in Catholic Bibles, as well as the Greek editions to Esther and Daniel that are not in Protestant Bibles because they do have irreconcilable errors. In fact, this is something that I brought up in my debate earlier this year with David Socal Preston, that there are errors meaning not Bible difficulties that can be explained with study and hard work and by studying the scriptures, but they're irreconcilable because uh, the deuterocanonical books say one thing while the Hebrew Bible and the New Testament say just the opposite, or it, it um, conflicts with verifiable science, verifiable history, unlike the books of the Hebrew Bible. But I, I don't want to go down that rabbit trail for the sake of time. But this is the reason why Fro might believe that there could be things in Scripture that are in error, and therefore, even though the New Testament writers are capable of error or are incapable of error, um, Scripture can be an error. Well, that's false. But the point being is that of the short is that both Paul and Rabbi Akiva were members of the Pharisaic school of Hillel, they were students of Hillel and then embraced the Hebrew Bible. And these were the books that were laid up in the temple, which again, we'll get to later. The second topic is, is sola scriptura versus the magisterium a false dichotomy? And Fro actually agrees, yes, but unfortunately he misunderstands what sola scriptura is and he misunderstands why it's a false dichotomy because he thinks that the differences between like uh, Catholics and Eastern Orthodox and other groups are, are relatively insignificant and they're not. Well, first of all, what soul scriptura is, is that scripture is the sole or only a divine artifact uh, from God or an artifact of divine revelation from God for Christian truth and doctrine as well as morals. So the dichotomy is that only scripture is this artifact of divine revelation, not the magisterium and, and not other um, uh, other religious groups. And the reason I say it's a false dichotomy for is because other groups like Eastern Orthodox also think they have this infallible authority, but they disagree with things that the Roman Catholic Church believes that are essential parts of doctrine and even affect salvation. Now, Fro says that Rome doesn't have a sole infallible authority. Well, yes, they do, because the magisterium declares or determines 
what scripture is and how to interpret it, which ironically, they've only allegedly interpreted six verses out of the entire Bible. And as we'll find out, one of at least one of those verses they have interpreted incorrectly. Um, but we'll get there when we get to that particular um, subject. Plus, when it comes to sacred tradition, they define what sacred tradition is and whether or not a, a tradition in the early church is um, official versus unofficial. The problem is if you were to ask a Roman Catholic for a list of official, infallible, sacred traditions, you're not going to find one. You're, you're not going to find any type of exhaustive list for that. So, so it's a bit um, circular and, and, and begging the question there. But as I mentioned earlier, Fro said that the Roman Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox don't disagree on significant ways. Uh, actually, yes, they, they do. And I gave examples um, of this in, in the short that I had mentioned, uh, such as a papacy, the papacy, um, the dogma of the, immac of the Immaculate Conception. E e they even have different books in their, in their Bible. But one of the significant things was the Filioque because the Filioque had led to the schism of 1054 it wasn't just about papal supremacy and and in my book that i mentioned earlier uh, why protestant bibles are smaller under the chapter of uh, about the eastern orthodox bible i had mentioned that the church in the east believed that pope benedict the eighth violated canon seven of the third ecumenical council of 83 431 which was a council of ephesus and the difference between a local council and an ecumenical council is that ecumenical councils are binding and they believe that since the words of the sun which is latin for filioque were not included in either of the two previous ecumenical councils of Nicaea or Constantinople. Their issue was that the Eastern Church um, wasn't whether or not the 11th century Pope had scriptural support for adding the Filioque to the Nicene Creed, but rather they argued the Pope could not on his own authority alone add anything to the creed not found in either of the ecumenical councils of Nicaea or Constantinople, without another ecumenical council to back up his actions. So in other words, the Pope had scriptural support for the Filioque, and I do believe he had scriptural support. But according to the Council of Ephesus, unless the Pope um, declared this with the backing of an ecumenical council, then he violated the ecumenical council of Ephesus, which was the third ecumenical council convened in 431. Because remember, at this point, uh, papal infallibility had not been established as a Catholic doctrine. This wouldn't happen until the 19th century. And this is one of the things that led to the uh, the split, the schism of 1054, because they're, they're saying the Pope didn't have um, ecumenical grounds for uh, adding to uh, the, the uh, creed of Constantinople you know, and Nicaea by adding of the sun or the filioque to the creed and that to which eventually led to the schism. So that was a, that, that was a major issue that even today, the Eastern Orthodox church are divided with the Roman Catholic church on this. They today, they still believe in the filioque while the Eastern Orthodox do not. Um, and regarding uh, the Eastern Orthodox, like the Immaculate Conception, they don't believe in the actual dogma, which is binding to all Catholics. Uh, to believe with threat of anathema so it's not and it's not just about mary being sinless it it's that she was sinless and that the stain of original sin was passed down to all mankind through adam according to romans chapter 5 and that she had remained sinless her entire life well the problem is the eastern orthodox do not believe in the stain of original sin being passed down through Adam because they understand that this would apply to Mary. It wouldn't apply to Jesus because Jesus did not have a human father. Plus, unlike Mary, Jesus is God and he could protect himself from this being passed down. But nonetheless, they believe that Augustine, who had championed and advanced um, this this doctrine of the stain of original sin being pa passed down. He, they believe that Augustine is wrong and they believe to this day that it was wrong. In fact, when I debated Robert Genis last year, which I'll put a link in the description for that debate, he actually conceded that the belief in and dogma of the Immaculate Conception of Mary, the way Rome defines it today, it's not found in scripture. It's not found in the early church. It's a doctrine that was 
established much later. I wouldn't call it a development because development would have to have uh, some earlier um, evidence for this in scripture in the early church, which it doesn't. It would be what Dr. Gavin Orland would call it an accretion, something that was established much later. So the the short and the uh, the point of the short that I was making is that sola scriptura versus the magisterium is a false dichotomy because there are other traditions under Christendom like Eastern Orthodoxy, which also believe that they have um, this infallible authority, but they disagree with the infallible authority of Rome on certain essential doctrines. So the true dichotomy isn't sola scriptura versus the magisterium, but sola scriptura versus ecclesialism. And the problem with Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox, they disagree with each other on es essential doctrines. So the next topic is did the Sadducees and the Pharisees have different canons? And this was actually the result of two different shorts that I did. One was arguing or asking, did they have different canons and did they have same canons? You know, so you can refer back to that. And I might put in the description a link to the shorts if I'm able to do that. Uh, one of the things Fro said is that Steve is eisegeting Jerome. I think he might have misspoke unintentionally. And I want to give Fro uh, the benefit of the doubt here because what I actually was referencing was Josephus. I wasn't referencing Jerome in my short because then he goes on to say, well, the reason that Jerome uh, may have um, believed this is because he's he's addressing his own camp. Well, Jerome actually believed that the Sadducees and Pharisees had um, end up having different canons. So, you know, so obviously he's saying Jerome, but he actually means Josephus. And we have to remember who Josephus was. He was the utmost uh, historian, uh, specifically a Jewish historian, at the end of the first century. So he's writing about the beliefs of, of the Jews uh, prior to and contemporary with his time. In fact, this is uh, from his work uh, against Appian. I'm going to actually, I'm just going to quote it here. He says, of these five are the books of Moses comprising the laws and the traditional history from the birth of man down to Moses' death. This period falls only a little short of 3,000 years. From the death of Moses down to Artaxerxes, who followed Xerxes as king of Persia, the prophets after Moses wrote the events of their own times in 13 books. The remaining four books contain hymns of God and precepts for the conduct of human life. From Artaxerxes down to our own time, the complete history has been written, but has not been deemed worthy of like trust with the earlier records because of the failure of the exact succession of prophets. Now, there's a number of things here. He's talking about these books, and he mentions that they are only 22 books, and he divides them into different sections. He divides them first into the five books of Moses, which record the time period from Adam and the creation of the world all the way down um, to the to Moses, and then from the death of Moses to Artaxerxes, which is roughly around 400 BC when the last book of the Hebrew Bible was written, uh, is about 13 books. And then he also mentions these four hymns of God, and it's pretty universally accepted that these refer to Psalms and Proverbs, and we know this because both the New Testament as well as extra biblical literature, both Jewish and Christian, around this time and even before in the Jewish era, identify Psalms and Proverbs as, as scripture and, and, and part of these uh, books that Josephus is talking about. And the other two is Ecclesiastes and Song of Solomon because they are written during the time period from, from the death of Moses down to Artaxerxes. And then these other, and, um, you know, and, and we know this because he then says that from Artaxerxes down to his own time, the complete history has not been written. So these would not have been these four, two of the, these other two books would not have been books that would have been written after 400 BC. And then he also goes, Josephus also goes on to say that basically um, all Jews, you know, from their birth would have understood and acknowledged these books. Now he's speaking in hyperbolic language because that would be sort of like me saying, well, everybody knows, you know, fill in the blank. Well, everybody in the world might not know that, like someone living on a desert island. But what he's trying to say is that everybody who is aware of this would have embraced it. Now, of course, there you could probably find a Jew here or there who, uh, who did not uh, believe in the same canon that Josephus is espousing to. 
or he's saying that the Jews as a whole is sponsored, but he's talking about the Jews as a whole. And these were the books that were laid up in the temple. Again, I'll get to that later. So we have to be careful about not marginalizing Josephus because he was a Jewish historian and he's writing about what the Jews as a whole had embraced. It's these 22 books and he tells the time period of these 22 books. And there's no indication from Josephus that the Pharisees and the Sadducees had, had different canons. Fro then responds, he says that the consensus of today's modern is a consensus. It's a consensus of today's modern scholarship that the Sadducees and the Pharisees had different books and that the Sadducees had only embraced the Torah. Well, one thing that Fro is not considering is that this consensus is based on origin. And it goes a lot of it goes back to Jerome, which Jerome also believed incorrectly that the Sadducees embraced the Torah, and he largely believed this because of origin, which we'll get into later. Then he ends up referencing me, and, and Fro says, "Well, Christie needs the Sadducees to accept the broader canon because it feeds into sola scriptura." Well, this is a straw man because sola scriptura doesn't have anything to do with canon formation. These are two completely different things because a canon is not a doctrine that's passed down. Again, it's an artifact of divine revelation, not a tradition, because if it's a tradition, then you run into the problem of, of the canon being determined by the will of man as opposed to be an artifact of divine revelation and the, and the will of God. And as I mentioned before, Beckwith even brought, brings up several books such as Joshua and Daniel and, and others that the Sadducees did accept you know, as scripture. But we, we could be living back in the days of Moses and only have the five books of Moses and still embrace sola scriptura, even if you don't have a settled canon. So the idea that I would have to accept uh, uh, the Sadducees accepting a broader canon in order to embrace sola scriptura is completely irrelevant, and it, it's a non sequitur. It's not true. Rather, Fro and, and other Roman Catholics really have the problem because they need the Jews to have different canons because they know that if the, the, there was a settled Jewish canon, we know what that is. It would be the canon of the Pharisees because we know that the Pharisees had embraced the same books that Protestants do today. This is something that was conceded by Gary Machuda, and that's why Catholic apologists like Gary Machuda, William Albrecht, uh, David Sarez, all those at Catholic Answers, uh, double down and have to defend that there wasn't a settled canon because if they were to concede that there was a settled Jewish canon in the first century and before, which there was, then they have a problem because they've got seven extra books in their Bible that the Jews did not accept because the Pharisees did not accept it. Plus, there's no evidence of there being a broader uh, canon that the Jews accepted in the first century or even before. There's none. The Pharisees didn't accept it. The Sadducees didn't accept this broader canon of the Catholics, and the Jews certainly didn't as a whole. And this leads to my uh, next topic about the, that he brought up about the great synagogue or sometimes called the great assembly. And I'm kind of surprised that he brought this up because this was not included in one of my shorts. At least I don't think it was in one of my YouTube shorts. It was something that's covered in my book, but it's actually uh, not a major argument. In fact, where's it at? Um, it, I only cover it for about five pages or so, and I end up citing Dr. Jeffrey Cohagen, who is the assistant professor of biblical theology at Boston College, as well as Dr. Michael Homan, who's the assistant professor of biblical studies at Xavier University of uh, Louisiana, that explains about this um, about this great synagogue uh, that was established around 400 BC, and then other books like the books of Ezra. Uh, which he was a leader of this alleged synagogue, had, had eventually had these books that he had written, like Ezra and, and uh, Nehemiah, as well as First and Second Chronicles. Um, but I'm trying to think if there's anything else that I had mentioned to. Uh, I also quoted uh, Dr. Wilhelm, Wilhelm Bacher, who's a professor of the Jewish Theological Seminary at Buddhist Budapest, Hungary, where he goes into talking about the great synagogue. And uh, lastly, I mentioned about Dr. John Barnett, who also had mentioned about how Ezra had broken these, these books down. 
into three separate sections, which is ironic because Jesus also breaks these books down into three separate sections in Luke chapter 24, verse 44, when he talks about the scriptures having this threefold division, which he calls the law of Moses and the prophets and the Psalms. And I'm not going to get into like the Psalm that when he says the Psalms, this refers to the third division and it's a metonym for the writings. You can look at my uh, my videos, you know, uh, and discussions and debates where I go into that in more detail. But we, I, again, I'm surprised that he ends up covering this because this is what's known as a Mott and Bailey fallacy, because he's arguing a point that's not a major argument in my book. It's not a major argument even in my debates and discussions. It's an argument that takes up only a few pages of my book. That's like I said, is about 270 pages long. And it ignores the greater uh, issue that this threefold division was established before the time of Christ because it was, and it was limited to the books of the Hebrew Bible. For example, if you look in the a prelude to Sirach, his grandson, when he's translating his father's work from Hebrew into Greek, he refers to the rest of the books. And this is very significant because this is very similar to Peter, who refers to Paul's epistles and comparing them to the rest of the scriptures by using the word rest it refers to a um, a limited and set amount so in other words the apostle peter by comparing paul's letters to the rest of the scriptures he's referencing back to the old testament knowing there was a settled canon and this is the same wording that the grandson of Sirach does in his prelude to his grandfather's works and even the footnote of the nab says by him saying this the, the law of Moses, the prophets, and the rest of the books are refers to the same books that are in Protestant Bibles today. Um, th then Fro goes on to talk about the, the mission, the Talmud, saying that uh, this was just a Jewish fable. But there's some evidence for, for this actually being true that there was an assembly because, as I've mentioned before, Nehemiah chapter 9 talks about this assembly that's gathered. And again, Nehemiah is the last chronological book of the Hebrew Bible written. And it begins with talking about Genesis and talks about numerous books in the Hebrew Bible. And then ends with 2 Chronicles. And the reason why 2 Chronicles is significant is because canonically, this is the last book that is included in the Hebrew Bible in today, as well as from Antiquity begins with Genesis, ends with Second Chronicles. And this is what the writer of Second Maccabees, chapter 2, verse 13, may be referring to when he talks about Nehemiah's memoirs. He could be referring back to this, and, and if you read that verse, he's talking about the books of the Bible as well as of the Hebrew Bible as well as other things. Um, so the question that I had for Fro on this is, well, what Jews in the first century or even before accepted the identical Roman Catholic canon? And again, you can't find any. The, the Pharisees didn't accept it. The Sadducees certainly didn't accept it. Even the um, Essenes didn't because people say, well, they found the Deuterocanonical books in the Dead Sea Scrolls. No, they only found two. They found Syriac and Tobit and a Greek translation of um, the Epistle of Jeremiah which demonstrates it was not part of Baruch. It was detached. It was it was attached later and eventually became part of that book. And Baruch was not found there, even though Jeremiah and Lamentations were, which demonstrates that Baruch was not originally part of, of Jeremiah Lamentations either. But that's a whole different topic there. So the uh, next topic that was brought up is a Roman Catholic challenge that I uh, just alluded to was can fro or any catholic name an identical catholic old testament prior to hippo and carthage so let's advance a few hundred years let's advance to the end of the fourth century which is when the councils of hippo and carthage convened in 393 and 397 uh, respectfully which by the way these were local or regional councils they were not universal they were not binding to everyone in the church because the churches in the east actually had a smaller canon back there even though the eastern orthodox have a larger one now back then it, uh, they were actually a lot smaller now froze uh, his response was in his videos he kind of danced around it and he never actually ended up answering this question he says well yes hippo and carthage were identical to Fl florence and trent but that's not the challenge that's not the question i asked i asked um 
Can you identify a Roman Catholic canon before Hippo and Carthage in the first 350 plus years of the church history? Can you find anyone like an individual Catholic, a Catholic council prior to, to Hippo and Carthage? And I would even argue that even Hippo and Carthage were not identical to Florence and Trent. And one of the things that uh, Fro brought up was about that I had misunderstood the difference between Ezra and Ezra's. What I do is I'll refer you to my the, my uh, video rebuttals. They're pretty lengthy, so I'm not going to go into them here. They're several hours because I'm res I was responding to a video series made by Dr. David Saras on Apocrypha Apocalypse, which he spent close to 12 hours making, and my response was uh, over six hours. Um, which is actually not bad because a lot of reviews are actually longer than the originals, you know, and I didn't cover every single detail, but just the main points. In fact, um, this isn't something that I even brought up in my book about like the whole Ezra Ezra things, but Dr. David Zaras that actually made this video, he's actually on my side in, in this without realizing it because um, he brought up two things that one, uh, the Syrohexapla, which was a 7th century trans Syriac translation of Origins Hexapla, included Third Esdras in its list in the fifth column of the Septuagint, demonstrating that Origins original Hexapla, when he's he's aligning the different versions of the Old Testament this time, included um, this third century BC writing, which was not later. Um, included in in the Council of Trent in the 16th century. Plus, David Saras said in more than one occasion in his videos that he believed that Augustine, who was a key member of Hippo and Carthage, believed this third century BC writing was scripture, which I go into into my videos. And the reason this is significant for is because Augustine was a key member of Hippo and Carthage. Plus, he was he was the bishop of Hippo, so he carried a lot of weight. And when he affirmed that this 3rd century B.C. writing that wasn't found later in the Council of Trent, when he said that he believed this is scripture, he says this after uh, Carthage and, and, and Hippo, Carthage and Hippo at the end of the 4th century. He's saying this and declaring this in the early 5th century. So if since he's a key member there, why would he be affirming this 3rd century B.C. writing as divine scripture? since he was a key member less than a less than half a century before maybe a quarter a century before at uh, hippo and carthage it would only follow that it was included in hippo and carthage um and we also have to remember that people like jerome and others would have utilized origins hexapla and as we know origins you know for what books belong in the bible well origins hexapla included this third century bc writing which is known as third esdras today the confusion comes from all the different nomenclatures because back then third esdras was referred to as the first book of esdras and it was and it was called the first book of esdras because it was believe that the third century BC writing had been translated into Greek before Ezra and Nehemiah were. And we have to remember is that the Old Testament was originally written in Hebrew, but eventually got translated into Greek and then got translated into Latin uh, later on in, in the early church age. So... No, I do not misunderstand the difference between Ezra and Ezra's. I've actually done a lot of work on this, and I'll refer you to those videos. Um, Fro also brought up about the Essenes. They were a major Jewish sect that accepted a broader canon. No, they didn't. We, even Catholic answers will, and, and people like Gary Machuda will concede. We don't really know what the canon of the Essenes were. You know, at, at best, we can say it's indeterminate. I'd be, it'd be sort of like what they had is that they had this vast library and the only books uh, prior to the time of Christ that the Essenes had regarded as scripture uh, that we know for sure are is the Torah. Because what they did is if you look at the margins and the columns and, and the spacing in between uh, lines, they treated the books of the Torah differently because the Jews were very Torah oriented. So even if there were like individual differences between different books as the canon started to form. Um, 
the four, five books of Moses weren't disputed by anybody, even the Samaritans who weren't actually Jews. They were kind of hybrids between Jews and, and Babylonians and other groups. They also uh, embraced their own version of the Pentateuch, um, and, you know, just as the Jews and the Sadducees had also embraced. Um, but as far as the other books that they had in their, in their, library they included books in their library that aren't aren't in any bibles at all like the copper scroll and, and the temple scroll and, and several others it would be no different than if i were to die and some were to co come into my library and they were to see a protestant bible and a catholic bible because i have both because i reference them they would they conclude that i'm a catholic and i believe in the books of the catholic canon no it simply means it's part of my library uh, but anyone who knows me knows that I only embrace the Protestant canon, not, not the Catholic canon. So it's the same with the Essenes. They had this huge library, but we can't say that they accepted a much uh, broader canon than the Sadducees and Pharisees do. It's not a defense at all for Jews having different um, you know, canonical boundaries in different books. Um, then he, Fro had mentioned that many Western fathers also accepted a broader canon. Well, I'll put a Again, a link to our debate in the description below, but I mentioned, I'm surprised he's still using this because in uh, our debate, I had mentioned that both Eastern and Western fathers, um, well into the church age, embraced uh, different canons. In fact, there are Western fathers who embrace the same canons that the, that the Jews and Protestants do today, and I had mentioned um, about Rufinus. He was a Western father. Jerome was a Western father. Uh, the, the list of Brianius, which again, even David's Dr. David Saris from Apocrypha Apocalypse concedes it's the same canon that um, Protestants and Jews have today. And it was written somewhere between the third century AD to the early to mid century uh, or fourth century AD. Origin was also identical, Hilary of Poitiers and Philokias. The, these are all. Uh, early church fathers, either in the West or the East, you know, that had embraced this. Now, the um, some of the church fathers in the East, like Cyril of Jerusalem and and uh, Athanasius of Alexandria, embraced the Book of Baruch, but it was largely because it had been attached to the Book of Jeremiah, and by then they had believed incorrectly that it was originally part of the Book of Jeremiah, or like it says, many had looked at it as an addendum as opposed to an actual book but um yeah many western fathers accepted a broader canon but many of them different didn't and a lot of it had to do with which ones knew what books that the hebrews had actually accepted and then fro mentioned that that the hebrew bible had a resurgence due to luther luther and islamic conquests that he goes off on this tangent that actually ends up becoming a red herring and, and irrelevant to what, uh, about the topic of the and relevance of the canon. But as far as the, the relevance of the Islamic conquest, what happened there is that it had ushered in the ability of the Christians in the East who had uh, largely gone by the Greek as opposed to the Latin when it came to the New Testament. And the West eventually and gained access to the New Testament because of these Islamic conquests, which is how uh, Luther was able to get a fresh copy of the Greek translation of the New Testament from Erasmus. You know, so that's all that has, a, have, has to do with it. It doesn't have to do with the Hebrew Bible because of the Islamic conquests. And the truth is, no, because Luther knew that the Jews did not accept the deuterocanonical books those seven extra books in in catholic bibles and he knew this because of his education he had he was a very well educated man he wasn't just some rogue a monk he had attended the university of wittenberg and he had earned two bachelors two masters and a doctorate degree so he probably knew no more about the canon than than most popes and cardinals and others in the Catholic Church because of his education. And that's the reason why uh, Luther eventually rejected it. Because you got to remember, these were these, this was a Catholic college, and he was educated and raised Catholic. It, there were no Protestant universities around that time. And yet, even with his Catholic education, he came to the conclusion that these books were not scripture. Uh, you know, because the, the Jews from antiquity did not accept them. Uh, the next 
topic is about Saint Epiphanius of Salamis in the fourth century and his work on weights and measures and his access to the Greek translation of the book of Jubilees, which had been translated in the first century BC before the time of Christ. And the emphasis here is in the Greek translation to the book of Jubilees, it explicitly states that the Jews only embraced 22 books, which are the same 22 books that are in the Hebrew Bible today, as well as the Protestant Old Testament. Now, Fro seems to think that the reason Epiphanius accepted this, accepted the Hebrew Bible, was because of uh, Eastern uh, Christian influence and because of geography. It was because of where he lived that the churches in the East um, accepted a smaller canon. But he completely misses the point, which I spelled out in, um, you know, in the short, which was that Epiphanius had access to Jubilees, the Greek translation of it, which the New Testament cites 14 times, which means Jesus and the New Testament writers also would have been familiar and had access to the book of Ju Greek translation of Jubilees, which stated before the time of Christ that the Jews only accepted 22 books. Um, for example, for example, um, Luther and the Reformers were Western, but they accepted the Hebrew Bible. I had mentioned this before. And even Jerome, they had, Jerome accepted the only the books that were in the Hebrew Bible, not, not the deuterocanonical books. Now, some Catholic apologists will say later on in his life, you know, that he may have come around and submitted to the authority of the church, but that was because he was doing a job. He was, he was translating uh, the Jerome's Vulgate, which ironically, he did not translate the book of Baruch. Again, this is something that even David Saras from Catholic, Apocryphal Apocalypse concedes. So the Luther's Vulgate did not accept Baruch, which is in Catholic Bibles today. Uh, and then Fro goes on, you know, talking about Epiphanius being born in modern day Israel, which means he would have had access to the Greek translation of Jubilees, which is backs up what I said before. And again, Epiphanius says that there are 22 books of the Hebrew Bible corresponding to the 22 letters of the Hebrews. And what's often missed about this is the reason why. It, they're usually they were grouped like this is because of pneumatic devices, you know, and that's why Epiphanius um, citation of the Greek book of Jubilees, why it says 22 books, the 22 letters of the Hebrews, because it's being used as a pneumatic device in order to remember there's 22 books. It's sort of like in the second century. It's I think it's either Justin Martyr or Irenaeus. I always forget. Uh, where he says, just as there are only four winds, north, east, south, and west, likely there are only four Gospels. Now, that's not proof that there's four Gospels because there's four directions of the wind, but there, that's the way of remembering it. Likewise, uh, when Jubilee says that there's 22 books, uh, just as there's 22 letters of the Hebrew alphabet, it's a way of remembering that these were the only books that the Jews accepted, and, and it's just a way of remembering. And then Fro goes on to talking about that it was racially motivated and racial supremacy. I don't know where he gets that, but that is not the re again. That's not the reason why Epiphanius embraced uh, only twenty-two books. It was because he had access to the Book of Jubilees, which is was written prior to the time of Christ. And this is the reason why he embraced the twenty-two books. It has nothing to do with geography. It doesn't have to do with racial supremacy or motivation. It's a complete red herring. So the, the next topic is, I got to go down here, Rabbi Akiba. When Rabbi Akiba said the deuterocanonical books and the gospels both make the hands unclean, and usually the argument goes, well, if a Protestant is going to reject the deuterocanonicals and use Rabbi Akiva as evidence for this, because he said that the Deuterocanonical books make the hands unclean, uh, or, or do actually this is a typo. Do not make the hands unclean. Let me see if I can. And I'm not going. I'm not going to edit it. But you have the idea, uh, just by me saying this, that the, do not make the hands unclean, meaning that they're not scripture. Then Protestants should also reject the Gospels because he also said the Gospels um, do not make the hands unclean. The problem with this, with this assumption which is something that I brought up in the short is that Fro misses the point 
that the reason he rejected, why Rabbi Akiva rejected the Deuterocanonical books and the Gospels is that he's rejecting them for different reasons. Again, Rabbi Akiva is living in the first century. He was alive when the temple was destroyed. He would have known, being from the school of Hillel, what books were laid up in the temple and what were which ones weren't, weren't just like the Apostle Paul was a Pharisee of the school of Hillel and a member of the Sanhedrin and also knew what books would have been laid up in the temple. It would have been these 22 books. And that's why Rabbi Akiva is saying that the Deuterocanonical books do not make the hands unclean, that they're not scripture. Now, the reason why he says this about the Gospels is because he rejected Jesus as the promised Messiah, which ironically came from the books and supported by the books that are, that mention him, such as Daniel that prophesies that the Messiah is going to come in the early third of the first century. In fact, if you take the Bible literally, you can use the book of Daniel and go right up to the very year and even the week where Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey and then he was crucified that same week. Um, and there's you know other passages in the Old Testament that point towards Jesus, you know, uh, such as being the suffering servant, and uh, in Isaiah 59 that he was crushed for our, our iniquities. As a matter of fact, if you go to Jerusalem today and you go into a synagogue of uh, unbelieving uh, Jewish synagogue, the rabbi will likely not quote Isaiah 53 because he understands, and Jews in general understand that it sounds too much like Jesus. Honestly, I mean, you, you can actually find this online. So, all so since, although Fro, Fro had you can, uh, excuse me had accused me of special pleading because Akiba said that both the Deuterocanonicals and the Gospels do not make the hands unclean. It's not special pleading when you understand why Akiba says these things and you understand who Akiba was, what school he was from, the time period that he lived. He would have known the books that were in the temple, just as the Apostle Paul did, and they were both from the school of Hillel. So no, it's not special pleading. So the next topic is, does the Roman Catholic Church infallibly interpret scripture? Now, Fro had made the comment in the discussion that, that I was raising a double standard because how the original text read is different than how it came to mean. And then he later talks about how I accept certain scriptures that are questionable even by Protestants. Uh, but the problem with this is that the original text is the original inspired writing and the divine artifact that was revealed by God through the writers of the Old Testament, the Moses and the prophets, and then later the apostles and, and their contemporaries like Mark and Luke. So what the original text wrote was what God was trying to um was trying to convey and that the original meaning is the actual meaning what had changed and this is the reason why a lot of protestants will say that copies of manuscript of original manuscripts and translations of manuscripts aren't necessarily uh, the same because they're not inspired because um because even with translations it's not an actual um, literal translation, no matter how literal you try to be, there's going to be problems in word choices and everything else compared to an original autograph. And there have been evidence of scribal errors. Um, in, even in the church age, when copying the scriptures, they were not meticulous like their Old Testament counterparts where they counted words and counted lines and stuff. And the reason I'm bringing this up for is because Fro had read, I think it was the RSV, you know, where it translates Genesis 3.15 as he will crush the head and you will bruise him you know, on the foot. And he said that Genesis 3.15, this translation is used to reference Jesus is incorrect uh, because it's too close. And Fro says that this is too close to the Hebrew. Well, the, the Hebrew is what Genesis was originally written in. So the question is, did the Hebrew actually support he as opposed to she? And, and the reason I'm bringing up the she for is because in the late 19th century, uh, Pope Pius IX had used a faulty Clementine translation. By faulty, I didn't say that it was, I didn't mean that it was junk, but rather the Clementine Vulgate was an, attempted to be an update to Jerome's original Vulgate and to try to make corrections. And as a result, 
it ended up uh, producing a lot of problems. And then the church ended up going back, Catholic Church went back to uh, Jerome's Vulgate. And in 1979, the something called the Nova Vulgata came out and it had correct the Clementine Vulgate where it, it read she back to the original Hebrew, Greek, and Latin, including Jerome's Latin, that rendered rendered he. And the reason this is important for is because the Pope was trying to use Genesis chapter 315 as scriptural evidence for the Immaculate Conception of Mary, that the, that the translation is she to refer to Mary, that Mary was going to, to crush the head. Uh, and uh, Fro went on went so far as to say that this was his opinion. If you, if you look at the video, he says it is his opinion that the translation into he is incorrect. He's not actually basing this on any scholarship at all, because I spoke with my friend Turretin Fan and Anthony Rogers and several others, and I did my own independent research, and the correct translation is, is he. In fact, I'll show in a minute that even um, Catholic authors and and apologists who have written books on Mary conceded that it's he. And Afro went on to say that those who actually believe this, including Roman Catholics and Protestants, are wrong, wrong because this refers to Eve's descendants when it talks about the seed of seed of Eve, which includes Mary. The problem is, is that seed simply means, it does mean descendants, but it's seed in the singular, it's not seed in the plurals. For example, if you read Galatians chapter 3, verse 16, it talks about Abraham's seed and specifically says this is talking about Jesus. So the seed of the woman, and the woman here is not Mary, the woman is Eve, because if you read through all of chapter 3, it says woman, 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 woman. In every single example, both before verse 15 and after verse 15, it refers to Eve. It does not refer to Mary. God doesn't suddenly change the woman to Mary uh, in order, be, be, because that this is an example of, of eisegesis, it, it doesn't follow. Um, the other thing is, when it talks in Genesis 3.15, when it says, you shall bruise the head, or you shall bruise his head, it's in the singular, because one of the arguments that Fro is trying to make is that he was it's referring to Eve's descendants, which would include Mary, but he says, well, you will bruise the head. This refers uh, to Jesus. And in fact, in Romans 16, 20, it actually says that Jesus bruises the head. It doesn't say that Je that Eve's descendants bru bruise the head. It's, it's, actually, it's actually Jesus that does this. But this whole point is complete red herring because Fro ignores the fact that the Pope's is a mistranslation is trying to prove scriptural support for the doctrine of the Immaculate Conception that this is talking about Mary, and it's not talking about Mary. In fact, I'm going to try to share, I'm going to take for a second, so I might sound different here. Um, I want to share a screen here. Uh, hopefully I'll do it right. Give me a minute here. Entire screen. Uh, this gentleman here is Christian Kappas. He is a Roman Catholic priest, and he had co-host a um, book with William Albrecht specifically on Mary. And this is from Pints with Aquinas. It's about a 29-second clip where he's asked, is the correct translation of Genesis 3.15, is it he or is it she? And so I'm going to play the clip now. Okay, so I'm gonna I'm gonna come back here. Get get back to the screen. All right, and and then plug myself back in here. Hopefully you're able to hear that. It's kind of testing and I'm not used to sharing screen says, but notice what he says here. Here's a Roman Catholic priest who co-authored a book on Mary with William Albrecht, who if you know him, Mary, he is very, let's just say he's, he's 
very unhealthily and unbiblically obsessed with Mary. And even during the discussion, um, Matt Frad on Pints with Aquinas asks William if he would agree with Christian Kappas because he's his co-author, you know, saying that it's he. And he says, well, yeah, I would agree that it actually is he, but I would say that it wouldn't um, affect anything theologically, saying that this could also refer to Mary because they were early paintings um, in the early church of Mary or, or, or of a woman specifically crushing the head of, of the serpent. And I just thought to myself, you're basing your, your understanding of a te text based on paintings by unknown individuals in the early church era when scripture is clear and your co-author just said the correct translation is he. And the reason this is significant for is because it's in the masculine he, so it can't refer to Mary. It can't refer to the descendants. Again, Abraham's seed is Jesus, Galatians chapter 3, verse 16. So the point is, the Pope was wrong, and he's attempting to infallibly interpret Genesis chapter 3, verse 15 as scriptural support for the Immaculate Conception of Mary, and he's interpreting it wrong. In other words, he's interpreting it fallibly. And there's a lot of other examples of these six allegedly infallibly interpreted scriptures, which, again, I'm not going to go into now. Um, but then Fro goes on just to advance. He says, Steve rejects um, the pericope adultery. In other words, it's a woman um, caught in adultery in John's gospel and a, a coma Johannum, which is in first uh, John chapter five, which affirms the Trinity. He says, we know it was not part of the original, but Steve accepts that it is scripture. This is what Fro says. Well, it's, there's many problems with this statement. First of all, I don't know it's not scripture. Rather, I'd say it's, it's likely possible it's not part of scripture because, or these verse not part of scripture for reasons that I'm not going to get into now, such as um, it not being found in John's gospel in early manuscripts, the, the uh, pericope adultery, it's sometimes found in Luke's or written in the margins and the comma Johannium was found in late um, Greek translations of, uh, of first John in the new Testament. Um, but it's but it's this is really a red herring because it's not addressing the the actual argument being made because this is addressing what books belong in the canon versus infallible translation and the issue has to be if the pope can indeed infallibly uh, has the power to infallibly translate the Bible and establish doctrine. Uh, and be protected without error. And we just demonstrated the Pope didn't do that in the late 19th uh, century. What Fro is bringing up here is about whether or not parts of the book of the Bible are, are part of canon or not. Well, that doesn't affect me because the point that Fro overlooks is, are these things supported or conflicting with the rest of scripture? So even if these examples like the pericope adultery, the coma johannium, or other questionable texts like the ending of, of Mark's gospel, if they were not part of the original, it doesn't affect doctrinal. It doesn't affect me as a Christian whether there's, there's scripture or not. But again, you're talking about two different things, the establishment of the canon and if these books are part of the canon versus if the Pope can infallibly translate scripture. This is actually more of a problem for Fro as a Roman Catholic than it is for me as a Protestant because in the Council of Trent, it declares of anathema if you reject not only the books of the Bible that were established at Trent, but any and all parts. And what's interesting is Fro stated that he does not believe that the Pericope Adultery, the Coma Johannum, and even the prologue to the Gospel of Luke were a part of the originals. In fact, he says the prologue to the Gospel of Luke, which I'm assuming he's referring to Luke chapter 1, verses 1 through 4, was added later. As a Catholic, he can't say that. Otherwise, he's anathema. Because a council of Trent explicitly state you have to believe in all of its part. You have to believe in the pericope uh, adultery or your anathema. You have to believe in the coma Johannum or, or your anathema. You have to believe in the ending of Mark chapters 9 through 20 or your anathema. You have to believe in the prologue and gospel Luke and not believe it was added later. Otherwise, you're an anathema. You know, so this is more of a problem for him than it is me. Um, and then he says, well, both translations, getting back to Genesis 3.15, the he versus the later she that was changed, uh, mean different things. Well, yeah, that's kind of the point. That's the reason why it's a problem for the Pope declaring it 
or translating it infallibly because they mean different things. The original intention is that it was he referring to Christ, not she referring to Mary, which was the later translation, which was based on the faulty trans translation of Clement of the Clementine Vulgate. Now, there are examples in the early church as far back as I think the fourth century uh, where uh, I think some versions of uh, the old Latin or the Latin uh, Veritas, I think it's Latina Veritas, I think it's called. But but the old Latin wasn't like a single translation like Jerome's Latin was a single translation. There were different versions of the Latin, and that's the reason why uh, Damasus I commissioned Jerome in order to translate uh a, a, a fresh copy of the Latin because there were so many problems and so many contradictions and, and disagreements and errors in, in some of the old Latin manuscripts. So there wasn't one old Latin translation. Um, what else? Uh, that Fro goes on to say, she is correct because this is a version received in the church. This is very similar to like when I had my debate with um, uh, Trent Horn on the canon of scripture and I made the comment, do you have any evidence prior to the uh, to, to the third century, prior to the time of Jerome, that the Sadducees embraced only the five books of Moses? And he kind of said the same thing. He says, uh, well, this is what's been received in the church and New Testament studies. So like Fro, he never actually answered my question. He kind of answered around it. He, he danced around it. And this argument that she is a correct translation because, there was, because it was a version received in the church— well, what was received was received much later. It was received centuries and centuries and centuries later and ignores that the Pope's interpretation that this is about Mary, Mary specifically to support the dogma with infallible interpretation is wrong. In other words, the Pope was wrong when he's infallibly interpreting this text You know, to mean that it's referring to Mary as opposed to Christ. So the she was wrong, the he was right. Um, and again, the original writings are what's inspired, not the translations or the copies. And we see this even in the New Testament. Like the New Testament writers, they occasionally will deviate from the Septuagint, including the apostles. Like Matthew deviating from the Septuagint version of Hosea, he ends up using a Greek translation that's closer to the originals. John does the same thing. He ends up deviating from the Septuagint numerous times and uses a Greek translation closer to the original. So in other words, they're not using a, tr a later translation based on their personal opinion. They're going back to what the originals, what the Hebrew would have said. In other words, they're trying to be faithful to the Hebrew. They're not, you know, in, you know they're not changing in order to, um, in order to back up a particular belief that would have been foreign to the Old Testament. So they're going back to the original meaning and the original intent that God had written through the Old Testament prophets. And again, that's that's different than what the Pope is doing. The, the Pope is using a later translation um, in order to not be faithful to the original Hebrew, which is he to refer to the coming Messiah, but rather to she to refer to Mary, which was a, which was a much later dogma. As a matter of fact, if you read Roman or uh, Genesis chapter four, when Eve gives birth to Cain, she actually thinks that Cain is the he that God is talking about, because he she says that I've given birth to God. Because in the in the, in the chapter, some translations have certain words that are italicized and. Uh, if it's italicized, that means it wasn't originally in the Hebrew. It was added by later translations. But she's thinking that she's given birth to God, and she's given and she gave birth to a male. And so when God says He will crush the head, she's thinking this is Cain, her descendant, her seed that is going to give birth, rather than a future male descendant. So you can go. go so you can go and look at uh, Luke chapter four for that. Um, to advance here. Yeah. To the next subject. He then, Fro then ends up leaving the shorts, you know, that I did on my YouTube channel. And he ends up talking about my discussion with my friend Jeff Robinson from Agoy for Jesus on the canon, specifically the clip from our discussion, because it's a long discussion. It goes well over like two, two or two and a half hours on the canon. It was a debate review from my debate with Trent Horn back in 2020. 
and this particular clip, it's about six plus minutes long, we talk about whether or not the Pharisees and the Sadducees had, had a different canon or not. And one of the things, like, Fro does this a lot, I know, is he makes a lot of accusations uh, as opposed to simply asking questions. But Fro makes the accusation, he says, we, meaning Jeff and I, we don't acknowledge the academic consensus against it. And actually, we do. We, we acknowledge the academic consensus. But what Fro doesn't realize or he won't accept is that the consensus is largely based on Jerome and origin. It's Jerome and origin who believed incorrectly that the Sadducees had a different canon than the Pharisees and that they only espoused to the five books of Moses. And then he does something where he says, where he's saying, well, um, it's not just Roman Catholics who believe that the Sadducees only em embrace the five books of Moses, but uh, the Eastern Orthodox do too. Well, in the discussion, and this is again known as the Mott and Bailey fallacy because he's he's focusing too much on one particular word I'm saying without on, without acknowledging the rest of the context of what I'm saying. And the context when I said that this is something Roman Catholics believe as opposed to Protestants is because I mentioned explicitly in the discussion that when I wrote my book about this, I'm writing the book with an idea of a Catholic audience. Obviously, other people are going to read the book. Protestants are going to read it. Even Eastern Orthodox are going to pre, um, read it. But because um, I'm writing to a Catholic audience and it's Catholics that believe that the Sadducees only wrote the five books of Moses, it's the reason why I worded things the way I did in my book. And that's all I was saying. I wasn't denying that Eastern Orthodox didn't also believe this because Eastern Orthodox didn't schism with the Catholic Church in the West until the 11th century. And well before then, uh, both the East and the West were believing incorrectly that the Sadducees had only embraced the five books of Moses because they based this on Jerome and Jerome basis earlier on origin. Um, Fro then goes on to say that uh, this is an accepted belief of New Testament studies that the Sadducees only embrace the five books of Moses, parroting uh, Trent Horn from Catholic Answers, who also said this and didn't actually answer my question. Prior to origin, do you have any evidence that the Sadducees embrace the five books of Moses? Answer is no. Trent never answered this. Fro, Fro never actually answered this. Saying that it's a belief of New Testament studies is, is not addressing the question. It's it's dancing around it. Um, and then he says, well, it's at the same level that, that, that we all agree that Jesus was crucified. So in other words, he's saying that the Sadducees embracing the five books of Moses has just as much acceptance and historical evidence as the... As the... Um, Sorry, my, my mom's calling, so I'm, I'm going to have to call her back. Uh, as the uh, as the crucifixion of Jesus, no, because the New Testament teaches that Jesus was crucified. Um, first century extra biblical evidence, like in First Clement, affirms that Jesus was crucified, and even into the second early second century, like Ignatius of Antioch, um, non. Uh, Christians such as Josephus also affirmed Jesus was crucified, and Josephus was an unbelieving Jew. He was not a Christian. So to say that there's just as much acceptance of the Sadducees embracing the five books of Moses as there is for um, Jesus being crucified is completely false because we don't have any first century evidence, no New Testament evidence, no evidence in the early to mid-second century that the, that the Sadducees embraced the five books of Moses like we have for Jesus being crucified. Um, Fro then goes on to say that we that we can't find authority that conflates the Sadducees with the Samaritans. So he's actually challenging Jeff and I. You know, where's this evidence? And he's saying, well, Steve isn't citing what Beckwith is actually saying. You know, so so where's this evidence? So again, going to um, Beckwith uh, in in uh, in pages eighty. 9 to 90. I'm just going to quote um, a couple passages here. He says, the Sadducees had possession of the temple, yet we saw earlier that the scriptures laid up in the temple included more than the Pentateuch. And it is true that their public actions, the Sadducees usually had to fall in 
with pharisaic views because of the pressure of public opinion, but this hardly means that the chief priests would have would have had to let the Pharisees lay up new scriptures in the temple, and still less that the high priest would have had to let the, them read the scriptures to them throughout the night preceding the day of uh, day of atonement. So in other words, even though the Sadducees would have had to give in to certain pressures, either politically or even religiously, as, as far as beliefs that the Pharisees would have uh, pressured the Sadducees to do, the one thing that they would not have done, they would have not allowed uninspired writings that the Sadducees did not accept into the Holy Temple, into the Holy of Holies, which is where the um, Ark of the Covenant was laid, because we find out from Scripture as well as extra-biblical evidence that the books were either laid next to the Ark in the Holy of Holies, or the Scriptures were laid actually inside of, of the Ark. And they would have not put uninspired Scriptures, Scriptures they did not consider to be um, to be not inspired scripture since they were the ones that laid the books up in the temple. Um, and it says that, that the scriptures in question were already in the temple before the Sadducees gained control of it in the late second century BC. So this is long before the time of Christ. And then he concludes by saying the Sadducees had joined up with the Samaritans in the second century or early third century not long before the time of Hippolytus and Origen, and as a result, had adopted or had, had attributed to them Samaritan tenets, which they had not previously held. So it was actually the beliefs of the Samaritans that they had held, but not the scriptures. There's nothing, there's no evidence of this. And this is kind of lengthy, but I want to read it, you know, so you can hear it in context. The two groups, the Samaritans and the Sadducees, had long held certain tenets in common, suggesting influence from the one side or the other as a formative period in the past. So when the Sadducees lost their only center of influence among the Jews through the destruction of the Jerusalem temple, it was reasonable that they should seek a home among the Samaritans. In the rabbinic literature, indications of Sadducean activity die out in the mid-2nd century. So the merger would have taken place between then and the writing of Hippolytus' refutation. And it was Hippolytus' refu refutation where we find this evidence. A few decades into the 3rd century, Actual evidence for this is not entirely lacking, for Hippolytus does not stop short uh, at attributing Samaritan beliefs to the Sadducees. He completely identifies the two groups, giving no separate account of the Samaritans and stating that the Sadducees live mainly around Samaria. This is in his refutation 929. So when, when Fro is asking, where is your evidence for this? It's in uh, Hippolytus' refutation 929. You, you can go look at at it online. Similarly, pseudo Tertullian, now Tertullian, like Origen, was a heretic according to the Catholic Church, but this isn't actually Tertullian. This is uh, writing falsely attributed to Tertullian in his third century appendix, which describes the Sadducees as an offshoot of the Docetheans, the main divergent sect among the Samaritans, perhaps indicating that by his time they were a Samaritan rather than a Jewish group. And other fathers, such as Epiphanius, repeat this. Nor is Samaritan testimony wanting on this matter, for in the Samaritan article written by this 14th century, it stated that the subdivisions of the Dothesians include some who pretended to be Sadducees and also an elder named Zadok, um, uh, and which is a derivative of a Sadducee. It seems, therefore, that long... As, for as long as the temple stood there, there was no essential disagreement among the different Jewish schools about the public canon. So the point being is, yeah, the Sadducees had to bend the knee to the Pharisees sometimes, but not when it came to the canon. And the reason is because the temple was sacred. And the holy of the holies was even more sacred. The only the high priest could go in there if he was ritualistically clean. And if he wasn't, he would be killed. There's no way that the Sadducees would have laid up books in the temple because the Pharisees believed in the larger canon they did. The only way that they would allow the Pharisaic books into the temple and into the holy of holies next or into the ark is if the Sadducees themselves believed it. In fact, you couldn't even bring in fresh copies from the outside to the inside of books that were recognized as inspired scripture. So in other words, they couldn't even bring the books of the Torah into the temple. They would have to be written inside of the temple once the old copies would begin to deteriorate or, 
or be damaged or whatever. Um, so so there, there's your citation. Now, Fro, one of the other things he said is that even if the Sadducees didn't accept Job, there would be theological reasons for them to use Job. Well, again, Fro misses the point that the reason they use Job is they were using scripture in order to deny the resurrection. Uh, and Fro had asked, well, why did the Sadducees disappear? And as I had read from Beckwith, it was because of the diaspora. After the destruction of the temple, the Sadducees knew their main job was was caring for the temple, laying books up in the temple, and the ritualistic sacrifices and everything. They, they were in charge of the temple. Once the temple was destroyed, they didn't have a home, so uh, they made their home likely with the Samaritans. At least that's the belief You know, in the second century they met up with them. But it doesn't follow that just because they shared tenants and they, and they had – Travel to where the Samaritans were, that they embraced the same books that they did. They, they would, it doesn't mean that they would have abandoned the books that they already accepted as scripture. It would be sort of like if something happened where I had to move into another country because of persecution or whatever, and I, and I move into a predominantly Catholic country or city, that doesn't mean that I'm going to embrace the same books that the Catholics do, even though we embrace a lot of the same tenets and beliefs, such as a virgin birth, the deity, the Christ, the Trinity, the atonement, and several other things. We agree about 80% of, the, of, of those things, but it doesn't follow that just because I, I blend in with Catholics that I'm going to embrace their canon. Their, I'm going to embrace their larger books. Likewise, it doesn't follow that the Sadducees would have embraced the same books as the Samaritans just because they moved into a Samaritan community. Fro then goes on to say that he believes in the, the majority agree in a smaller canon. Um, and he believes that the Sadducees and the Samaritans merge because of common beliefs. Yes, again, common beliefs, not common canon. And uh, the majority of agree come much later. And as I keep stressing, it's because of origin who had, as we'll find, find out, incorrectly misinterpreted Josephus. But again, that'll come later. Uh, Fro said the Essenes believed in much more, much larger canon than the Hebrew Bible, but we discussed earlier this is not true. They had a larger library, but it's impossible to know specifically what books that they embraced as scripture. But they had originally been uh, part with the Pharisees, and they had split off a couple hundred years before the time of Christ. So in all likelihood, they had accepted the same books as the the Pharisees. There's just the question of Esther, which they had a book called Proto Esther. So to, as Lee Martin McDonald said, it would be wrong to assume they did not embrace Esther. And as Trent Horn stated in our debate, we find wineskins of the Essenes celebrating Purim. Well, why would they celebrate Purim for? Because it's found in the book of Esther. But that's a that's a different issue. Um, Fro then said the Sadducees believe that Daniel was right on some things. Uh, but he could be wrong on other things like angels. And that, so he was using Daniel, uh, not as scripture, but simply as the source of, the, of things that he agreed with Daniel while, re while, them, while the Sadducees rejecting the, the book of Daniel itself. Well, no, because as Jeff and I point out, Genesis does teach about angels. And the Sadducees believed in, in Genesis as well as the rest of the Torah. The, the point that was being made by Jeff in our discussion is the Sadducees had allegorized the book of Daniel, including the belief of angels in, 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 the, in the resurrection. In fact, I'm going to cite from um, a, a lot of these passages are from uh, the pages in, in the 80s. So um, in this is from page 87 to 88 from back with this, and I'm going to read the whole section because it's significant. The Sadducees rejected belief in the resurrection, which is clearly taught or implied in the prophets and the hagiographer. So their canon must have consisted of the Pentateuch alone. And the context here, Beckwith is explaining this argument. He's saying this is the argument that people are making that because it's clear in the prophets and the hagiographer, if they're if the if they're rejecting the um, uh, the resurrection and uh, angels, then this is when this be proof that they rejected the you know these these books. But then he goes on. Beckwith goes on to say, however, Hippolytus tells us that they explain references to the resurrection in a non-literal manner as referring to the children 
whom one leaves behind when one dies. This is in Refutation 929, which I had mentioned before by Hippolytus. So the conclusion does not follow. It could equally be argued that since the Sadducees re rejected belief in angels, which appear in Genesis 19 and other passages, the Pentateuch cannot have been in their canon either. So the argument is, if you're going to say that they rejected the resurrection and angels, which are clearly taught in the prophets and the writings, then you would have to say the Sadducees also rejected uh, the uh, the books of Moses for this very same reason. In fact, when the Sadducees are talking to Jesus in the Gospels and they're talking about the resurrection, he ends up citing the uh, the book of Exodus because they're drawing from the book of Exodus as evidence for the resurrection. So he's saying your your belief is false, you know, and the resurrection is something that was taught not just in the in the law, but also in the prophets and the writings. Um, okay, and, and I'm gonna I'm gonna cover that a, a little bit in a little bit later as well. Now, one of the things that he says that uh, he's that Fro says is that uh, Esther, Judith, Jonah, uh, Tobit, and Job these are works of pious fiction and not meant to be literal. But this is. This is Fro's opinion. I mean, it says who? I mean, this is there, there's no actually evidence that this that these books are meant not to be literal. They might be some of these might be poetic books, but um, but Jonah and no, J Jesus actually references Jonah that Jonah is is speaking about him and he's using this correlation about being in the belly of, of the great fish for three days and three nights. Plus. Uh, we know that Job was a real person, and this is a real um, this is a real story because in Ezekiel 14, he, the prophet believes that Noah, Daniel, and Job were real people. You know, so this is not just what he would describe as pious fiction, but you can understand this because even the New Catholic version of the Bible says that the Book of Judith is not meant to be taken historically, but it is part of pious or edifying fiction. So since Judith is because, and the reason is because there's clear irreconcilable errors and contradictions with the rest of scripture. Therefore, these other books that Fro believes like Esther, etc., you know, are as well. Um, and then he goes on to say something really odd. He says that Esther is written as a slapstick comedy by who it's like, Fro, you're, you're not an authority here. Um, because he says that Jews actually read Esther during their festivals, and this is evidence that it's the, it's it's slapstick comedy. No, the reason that, that they do it during festivals is because the Jews celebrate Purim, which only come from the book of Esther. They're celebrating it because they recognize it as an actual event that was recorded as a historical event in the book of Esther. So while Judith may be part of edifying fiction, as well as the other books like Tobit that are in the so-called deuterocanonical books. The other ones are not. Job, Jonah, Esther, they're all historical events. They're and, and even though some of them might be part of what's called the the poetic writings, by poetic writings, it means that they were in it, it uh, they're in a separate division from the prophets as, as well as the law. Um then he mentioned makes, makes a comment that when it comes to angels, when when the book of genesis talks about angels it's actually referring to god uh, such as when uh, jacob ends up wrestling with god he ends up wrestling with this this angel he wrestles with this man but there are other mentions of actual angels in the book of genesis like with abraham and um, eve get kicked out of the garden angel uh, garden of eden and this angel with this flaming sword blocks them from going back in because he doesn't want them eating from the tree of life. There's no indication that this is actually God that's got this flaming sword because he stays there. It's an actual angel, whether it be a holy angel or a fallen angel, we don't know, but it, it's clearly an angel, you know, so that, so the angel of the Lord thing doesn't work. Plus when it, when a manifestation of God is mentioned in the Bible as the angel of the Lord, whether it's in the law or if it's in the prophets like Zechariah, it says it's the angel of the Lord. It's it's it, it, it says that it's actually God, which you can read about in Zechariah. Uh, 
the fro goes on to say that the Sadducees argue away angels that, that are in that, that are drove. Well, that's kind of our point that they had this allegorical way of teaching, which is what both Jeff said as well as what I read from uh, from Beckwith. Fro then says that uh, corrects Sadducees on the resurrection from the Torah. Okay, so he says that Jesus actually corrects the Sadducees on the resurrection from the Torah. So if why wouldn't he correct them from other parts of the Bible like the prophets or the writings? Well, again, Beckwith answers this in chapter or uh, page 88. And he says, when Jesus is in controversy with the Sadducees, he answers their argument against the resurrection by referring to the Pentateuch. Though he could much more readily have answered it from the other sections of the canon had the Sadducees accepted these. However, the Pentateuch was the basic section of the canon, and as the Sadducees had drawn their argument against the resurrection from the Pentateuch, Jesus draws his counterarguments from the same source. So in other words, the reason why he's Jesus argues and answers the Sadducees from the Torah rather than the prophets of the writings, which would have been easier, it's because he's using their same source. They're arguing from the Torah uh, as evidence against the resurrection. So he's correcting them from the Torah, from their same source. So in other words, it would be no different than if a Catholic were to argue something from the, from the deuterocanonical books, but then I were to argue um, against them from their very same source, from the deuterocanonical books, it doesn't mean that I accept those books. Likewise, when Jesus is answering from the Torah, that doesn't mean that this is evidence that the Sadducees rejected the prophets and the writings. It simply means that he's arguing from the same source that they're using. In other words, they're saying, you're, you're wrong, even though you're using this source, I'm going to correct you from the same source. Another thing too is elsewhere Jesus utilizes the prophets as scripture with the Pharisees, you know, which we brought up earlier. Uh, Fro then ends uh, my discussion with Jeff, where Jesus appealed to the prophets and the Sanhedrin and the Sadducees. Well, when we're talking here, we're mentioning that Jesus had appealed to the Sadducees and the Sanhedrin, which were also made up of Sadducees, specifically as scripture. And the reason he does this for is because he's affirming their canon. He's affirming that the Sadducees embrace the prophets as well as the law. Otherwise, he wouldn't have done this. It, it wouldn't have made sense. And in Daniel, it uses the term son, son of man. Now, Fro says that there's imagery in the Torah. You know, so when the, the, the use of the word son of man, Jesus is referring back to the Torah. But as I mentioned earlier, Jesus is actually quoting from the book of Daniel when he says the son of man. He's not he's not quoting from the Torah. And then Fro concludes by saying this is blasphemy. This would be blasphemous to the high priest because Jesus is equating himself with God. And that's be, well, that's because the high priest was a Sadducee. And this is coming from the book of Daniel which the Sadducees would have recognized as scripture. Otherwise, it wouldn't have meant anything to him, to, to the Sadducees if they just embraced the five books of Moses. All right, and we're, we're getting down to the end here. There's only about three topics that are left, so bear with me here. The next point is going to be that he that Fro brings up about Josephus and his quotation from Antiquities of the Jews because one of the arguments that we made was, and I've even made my shorts, is that the belief that the Sadducees only embraced the five books of Moses comes from Origen, who had misquoted uh, Josephus you know, in Antiquities of the Jews. And Fro had cited chapter one, where it says Jesus may have been a Pharisee or shared some belief. Um, well, before he quotes this, this is what uh, Fro says. Well, if Jesus was a Pharisee or he had the same belief, well, that means Jesus would have accepted the same canon as a Pharisee if he was a Pharisee or or he embraced these same beliefs about the canon as a Pharisee did. So Fro's argument actually ends up working against him, and it supports the fact that Jesus em embraced the same books as the Pharisees did if he was indeed a in Pharisee or he shared the same canon. Um, but when he when Fro quotes antiquities of the jew chapter one i think it's paragraph four 
uh, regarding the Pharisees, he quotes Josephus, who says, quote, the doctrine of, doctrine of the Sadducees, the souls die with bodies um, and not entertain other things than the law enjoins them. So what he's saying is by the law, the Sadducees are only embracing the five books of Moses. And he denies that this is referring to oral law. Well, in again, on page 18, section 3, it says, According to Josephus, Antiquities chapter 18, the Sadducees own no observance or any sort apart from the laws, plural, that is the Pentateuch. However, as the following words hint, and as the more or less parallel account of the Sadducees, um, I'm just looking at something here. Okay, the Sadducees in Antiquities chapter 13 explicitly states, the contrast is not between the laws of Moses and the other books of the canon, but between the laws of Moses and oral tradition. Josephus elsewhere states that all Jews, presumably including the Sadducees, accept the 22 books of the canon. This is in his work against Appian. So if Josephus is saying that the Sadducees only embrace the five books of Moses, he would be contradicting himself later on in against Ampion when he said that all Jews, which would include the Sadducees, embrace 22 books. And as we know, the Torah only has five. You know, so how do you get from five to 22 unless Josephus is not saying what Fro thinks that he's actually saying? And again, I'm going to share this screen. And hopefully you'll see it. Okay. I apologize if the other one didn't come out the video, but if I missed it then, or if I screwed up or whatever, I'll, I'll put the link, you know, from a uh, Christian campus of, about the he from Genesis 3.15. But anyways, this is an article that was written by Dan Stewart. He's a Christian author of more than 20 books. And this is on blueletterbible.com. And it says, it's under the air card. There was a misunderstanding of the Jewish writer Josephus. This is, you know, part of the article. It says, but what about the statement made by Josephus? Didn't he clearly say the Sadducees only accepted the law of Moses? The answer is no. This idea comes from a misreading of Josephus. For example, Origen understood Josephus' statement to mean that the Sadducees accepted only the law of Moses as scripture. However, Josephus was not referring to the law of Moses as opposed to all the writings which make up the scriptures. Rather, he was speaking of the written law versus the oral law. Another of his statements makes this clear. He wrote, so here he's quoting from Josephus in Antiquities of the Jews, not from chapter 1, but from chapter 13, section 297. Quote, the Sadducees hold that only written laws should be reckoned valid, but that those handed down by tradition from the fathers need not be observed. And by tradition, he's talking about the oral laws. This would be things like Korban. So um, Stuart goes on to say, this does not imply the Sadducees rejection of the Old Testament canon of scripture, only that they held the written scripture to be valid, not the oral law, which had been passed down. Furthermore, nowhere in the writings of Josephus do we find the slightest hint that any of the Jews accepted a different uh, canon of scripture, while Josephus tells us of the existence of many different sects of Judaism that exist in the first century, as well as their unique beliefs. He never says that the issue of the canon was one of beliefs which divided these groups. To the contrary, his writings assume that the canon of scripture was a common heritage for all Jews, no matter what their particular beliefs may have been. Okay, so there's your evidence from Josephus that he was not affirming that the Sadducees believed in a different canon, that they only embraced the law of Moses. He was talking about the Sadducees only embracing the written law, not the oral law. They would not embrace something like Korban that's mentioned in Mark chapter 7. And that's the reason why Jesus attacked the Pharisees rather than the Sadducees, because the Sadducees did believe in oral tradition, unlike um, the Sadducees, who had only believed in written tradition, you could almost say that the that the Sadducees were kind of the Protestants of their day, and the Pharisees were the 
or the Roman Catholics of their day, which is ironic because it's the Pharisees that actually embrace the same books that Protestants do. But as we're finding out, so, so did the Sadducees. There's absolutely no evidence that the Sadducees believe in any less books than the Pharisees do, let alone that they only embrace the five books of Moses. Unfortunately, this is a misreading of of um, origin and unfortunately fro is quoting from josephus in the wrong chapter it's not chapter one which does not even allude to the sadducees only embracing the law by the law this refers to the written law rather in chapter 13 of antiquities of the jews josephus talks about the sadducees only embracing written law over oral law um Fro then goes on to say about Josephus, the Sadducees addict themselves to the notions of the Pharisees. Again, this has to do with doctrines and rules, not the canon. And then at this point, you can see Fro getting unfortunately upset and, and frustrated where he condescendingly um, saying that, uh, that, that the me saying, well, they rejects the Sadducees didn't only lay up non-scripture in the temple. Um, well, the problem is that there's an Old Testament precedent which I had mentioned at the very beginning, which I'm going to quote from Beckwith on page 81 to 82, where he says, one of the corollaries of the holiness of scriptures was that they were especially suitable to be kept and used in holy places. This was recognized by the Therapeutae, whose affinities were Essene, and they took into their sanctuary none of the general necessities of life, but only the scriptures and other edifying books. So you find even the Essenes had an affinity and put books in their, in their particular holy place that, that they recognize as scripture. And it was recognized by the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and they admitted no books but the scriptures and items like the priestly and Levit Levitical genealogies into the Jerusalem temple, the laying up of books and writings in a holy place, and in some cases the writing of them. There are practices very early attested in the history of Israel and paralleled among other neighboring people. The... Keeping of holy books in temples was a common existing amongst the Greeks and Romans and apparently also existing as early as the third millennium BC among the Egyptians. And, and here is the scriptural evidence for us. The earliest Israelite examples of those concerning the tables of the Ten Commandments and the book of Deuteronomy laid up respectively in and beside the Ark of the Covenant in the tabernacle. Exodus 25, Exodus 40, Exodus 10, Exodus 31. And the record of uh, Joshua's covenant with the people written in the copy of the book of the law in the sanctuary, Joshua's 24, and he gives uh, many other examples. Um, he goes on to say that the writings laid up in the temple and in the earlier Israelite sanctuaries were sacred either by reason of their origin or by reason of their subject matter in both. One of them was recorded to have been written by the finger of God, Exodus 31. 32, 34, Deuteronomy 4, uh, and chapter 10. And numbers of them had been originally been composed by men of prophetic gifts to embody the messages that they had received from the Lord. And then he concludes by saying, the laying up of something in the temple had the effect of dedicating it to God and so gave it an additional sanctity. So again, there is no way that the Sadducees who had control of the temple since the second century BC would have allowed books into the temple that they did not believe were scripture, that they had not recognized as scripture. Even books by the Pharisees who allegedly would have had a larger canon according to Roman Catholics like Fro and others. They Again, the Sadducees may have bent the knee to the Pharisees on certain things like customs and traditions and even rules, but they would not have laid up uninspired books that did not make the hand unclean into the holy temple into the holy of holies um so so that's um so so that's it there uh let's see what else uh so fro also makes a false accusation that i believed in jews separation of church and state well this is straw man because this has nothing to do with this i mean he's again he's assuming that if something is political, it would be religious, and so therefore, if they're bending the knee to the Pharisees, they would bend to the uh, neither in political reasons they would bend the knees to religious reasons, including um, the, the the books laid up in the temple that they would have actually allowed uninspired books in, into the temple, and as we sh we just demonstrated, they wouldn't have. Uh, so, again, the whole point is 
the reason why Fro and others believe that Josephus is saying that the law refers to the law of Moses and they would have only the Sadducees would have only embraced the five books of Moses is because they're misunderstanding and possibly not reading chapter 13 of Josephus's Antiquity of the Jews, that this was referring to the written law was the only thing that they had embraced, not the oral law, because the Pharisees believed in both. Uh, the second to last topic, uh, actually, this is the last topic, and then I'll mention just a review is about origin you know an idea that origin had misinterpreted josephus and as we see, just saw and from what i read earlier by beckwith he that he did because fro had quoted a chapter 49 of a work from origin where he says that sadducees and samaritans believed in the same thing well that's the point they did have many tenants in common but they did not have the same canon that is not something that even hippolytus writing around the same time as Origen in his refutations concede. He actually concedes that the Sadducees had a allegorical approach to things like angels and the resurrection, but it does not follow that they that they um, only believed in the five books of Moses. Uh, and that's because he believed Fro believes that the Sadducees and Samaritans agreed on the Torah alone, which is not, which is false. So, in conclusion, just kind of a review and some resources uh, why Protestants believe in the, um, you know, believe that the historical and biblical view that Jesus and the apostles and the Jews from antiquity only believed in uh, the books that are in Protestant Bibles today, aka the the um, the Hebrew Bible. No, this later. Well, first of all, this, as I mentioned during the discussion, later idea of the great synagogue or the great assembly comes from Nehemiah chapter nine, which begins talking about Genesis, ends with Second Chronicles, which was, which is ironically the first and last book in the Hebrew Bible of antiquity and even today. And it actually says there, this was an assembly or a another word for assembly is is synagogue. It was a gathering together of the Jews. You know which demonstrates these books were already in their canon, um, you know, as far back as the time of Nehemiah and Ezra. The prologue to Sirach says the rest of the books, which the footnote to the New American Bible, which is a Catholic translation, says it's the same books that are in Protestant Bibles today. So Sirach's grandson is saying that the law of the prophets and the rest of the books refer to the books from his grandfather's ancestors, which not only has a threefold division that 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 Jews even have today, but by the rest of the books is talking about a settled canon, just as Peter said, compares Paul's letters to the rest of the scriptures, meaning there is a settled canon of the Old Testament, and he's saying Paul's letters are just as much inspired scripture as the rest. Sirach chapter forty-four to forty-nine. It's interesting when you read that, it mentions a lot of books of the Hebrew Bible, not all of them, but it begins with Genesis and ends with Second Chronicles. The Greek translation of the Book of Jubilees that Epiphanius had access to in the 4th century in his On Weights and Measures, this was a translation of the 1st century BC, which says that the Jews only espoused the 22 books. And as we know, the Greek translation of Jubilees was cited 14 times in the New Testament, so Jesus and the apostles and the New Testament writers would have been certainly familiar you know, with this writing, and therefore, you know, these 22 books uh, that are espoused by the Jews is what Jesus as a Jew and the apostles as Jews would have also espoused to, as well as Josephus at the end of the sec first century, who wrote that the Jews as a whole, which would include the Pharisees, Sadducees, Essenes, and everyone would have only embraced 22 books. And we know what those 22 books are, the books of the Hebrew Bible, which are enumerated in Baba Bathra in the second century, as the exact same books that are in, in Protestant Old Testaments today. And this 22 books, you know, is shared by Origen, Bryanius, uh, Amphilochius, Hilary, Rufinus, Drome, as well as Jews like Akiva, Aquila, Baba Bathra, writing, the, and the Apostle Paul, as well as Josephus, who said that there's only 22 books in his uh, Against Ampion writing. And also the Sadducees, um, did not allow uninspired writings in the temple, and the Sadducees had actually looked to the book 
if we read in the Gospels, the Sadducees actually look to the book of Micah uh, for the Messiah's birth, which Micah is part of the prophets, not part of the five books of Moses. And the, um, the, the point that I've made and Jeff made and Protestant gen general made is we don't get a Catholic Old Testament canon at least until 350 plus years after Jesus, meaning the end of the fourth century, the, ch the church councils of, of Hippo and Carthage, and even Rome is questionable. Even some Catholics, you know, question that council, um, whether or not it's enumerating the same list. And then you got Luther not translating Baruch into his Latin Vulgate, which would have been the, the, um, the version of the Bible that would be used for centuries you know, in, in a church age after that. And even Hippo and Carthage are questioned whether or not they have the same books because even uh, Catholic apologists like Dr. David Sarez from Apocrypha Apocalypse has conceded that Augustine, who is a key member of Hippo and Carthage, uh, later on in the early um, fourth century after these councils, believed that Third Esdras, which is not part of the Catholic canon and not part of the Council of Trent, uh, he believed that this this third century BC writing was scripture. So why would he be believing this if earlier at the end of the fourth century of the two councils he was a key member of did not include this writing? So it would follow that thir that third Esdras was part of this council, but it was identified as first Esdras or the first of the two books of Esdras because it was believed to have been translated into Greek before the combined book of Ezra and Nehemiah were. One last point is uh, during the discussion, Fro had mentioned that he had talked with my friend Kelly Powers from Berean Perspective Apologetics on his channel. He had an open mic and he was talking about a specific topic and he accused Kelly of kicking him off. Well, I talked with Kelly yesterday and he had mentioned that the reason why he kicked Fro off wasn't because of a gotcha moment, but because he was talking about a specific topic. And when you have a specific topic you're talking about and you invite someone to talk about that topic, you don't come on talking about irrelevant things or things that have nothing to do about it. And, and he gave Fro several chances to stay on topic and he refused to. He wanted to talk about something else. And that's the reason why he was kicked off. So Fro, if you're listening to this, be honest. That's the reason why he kicked you off. To say that he kicked you off because of a gotcha moment is 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 being dishonest. And I'm trying to be as charitable by saying that as possible. But that's the reason why. And you owe it to anybody who listens to your channel that and to be honest about the real reason why that happened for him. You know, and it's not just Protestants that do that. Catholics do that as well. I mean, Catholics, you know, like William Albrecht, they will kick people out as well as Sam Shamoon, who is a disgusting human being because of some of the language and vulgarity that he uses that I can't repeat here. He will kick people out for talking about things that are relevant. You know, he'll just kick people out. But if it's not relevant at all and, and, and a Protestant wants to push him, he'll kick him out as well. So it's not just Protestants you know, that do that. So, um, like I said, this is the end. I know this took probably longer than I had had uh, anticipated, but hopefully I covered everything in depth. And in the description below, I'm going to try to um, have some links like my debate with Fro, uh, uh, David Socal Preston, Dr. Robert Sengenis, my response video to David Saras, uh, regard, specifically regarding the book of Ezra's. I've got it over um, two sections. Uh, the Blue Letter Bible article, you know, that I had about from uh, Dan Stewart about the Sadducean canon and the context of Josephus, uh, as far as what he actually said. Uh, my discussion with Jeff Robinson from A Goy for Jesus, at least that little bitty clip I'll post. Um, and I would recommend people, you know, getting this book from from Beckwith if you want something really meatier. I mean, my, my book, it, the average layperson can can read. I, I I wrote it at that level. But if you want some really hard meat, you know, about the canon and why Protestants believe what they do, you know, pick up his book, The Old Testament Canon of the New Testament Church on Amazon. And I'll put a link in the description um, as well. And I'm going to put the uh, clip from Pints with Aquinas just in case it didn't come out here because I'm still um, – testing things out. So I might not have, you might not have done it right, but I'll put the clip where William Albrecht's co-author on their book on Mary, uh, Christian Kappas, who's a Roman Catholic Protestant, concedes that, that the correct translation of Genesis 3.15 is he, not she, and that in the attempt of 
the Pope trying to defend the biblical evidence for the Immaculate Conception of Mary. It turns out he interpreted it fallibly, not infallibly, in order to defend this dogma. And then I might put, a, if I'm able to, I'll put a link to some of my YouTube shorts. So thank you, everybody who uh, listened this far, and I'll try to uh, put uh, timestamps, you know, in the in the in the description below, so you can jump to particular topics if you want. So uh, thanks, everybody. God bless you, and stay safe out there.